Amen. Amen. Thank you, Corey. And uh, good morning, City Light. Uh, it is good to be with you guys. Um, I love getting to follow Jesus with all of you. And uh, if you've been with us for a little while, been around our church a little bit, you know that for us, part of following Jesus is we go through books of the Bible together. We cherish the Bible as God's word to us. And so we just preach through books of the Bible, which also means that we tackle tough topics as the Bible brings them up. And uh, today is a tough topic. It's, it's a difficult passage, guys. There's no like fun or lighthearted way to introduce the passage to us. As Proverbs is gonna show us, there is nothing funny or lighthearted about sexual sin. So, as a friend and a pastor, I simply invite you, would you listen with courage? And would you ask God to speak to you? Uh, the summer after my eighth grade year was such a mixed bag for me. Um, I remember nearly every day, me and my friends, we would strap on our rollerblades and just go skating all over the neighborhood, in and out of ditches, building our own ramps, playing street hockey until the sun set and we finally had to go home. Um, but also that summer after eighth grade, one day we were all skating, we went over to our friend's house, and I thought it was just like another, you know, stop in to get water and a popsicle sort of thing. But while we were at our friend's house, he came walking out of a room to where the rest of us guys were, and he came in with a stack of magazines. He passed those magazines out to different guys and groups gathered around the magazines. And that day, I was exposed to pornography. It's, it's scary to me how vivid my memories of that day still are. How I felt, how after a little while we just like went back to building ramps again, how I made a pact, an agreement with myself to never share that with my parents, um, how I like loved and hated that experience all at the same time. And that wasn't the last time I looked at pornography. It set in motion a pattern in my life that hung around for years. And the shame grew worse and worse and that love-hate relationship only got more and more complicated. This morning, the Proverbs that we're reading deal with sexual sin. And I mean, they can sound just like a list of rules and regulations or maybe like a Victorian schoolmaster making sure everybody abides by the dress code or like a parent who's prude and anti-passion. But how I wish, oh, I wish, my dad would have sat down with me and gone through Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 before that summer after eighth grade. How I wish I would have never made an agreement with myself to hide that sin from my parents. That I would have like actually given them a shot to have a conversation like this one in Proverbs. Have a shot to have that conversation with me. Really the, the pain and the shame and the hurt of sexual sin, it still hurts me to this day. And so <laughs> we're going into this passage, City Light, honest and humble. And what we're going to find, we're going to be listening in to this conversation between a dad and his son. And the dad does a couple things. The dad highlights the empty promises of sexual sin. And he also highlights like the true delights of marital passion. He's going to point out the empty promises of sexual sin, but he's also going to point out the like true delights of marital passion. So we'll get into it in a moment. But first, let me just say a few things about sexual sin and what I in the book of Proverbs mean by that. Um, throughout Proverbs 5 through 7, sexual sin is personified as a woman. Like in chapter 5, verse 3, sexual sin is a forbidden woman. In chapter 5, verse 20, sin is an adulteress. In chapter 6, verse 24, sin's an evil woman. 
But, but please know, this is not the Bible's way of saying that women, the female gender, is evil. It's not saying that women are the problem and men should just avoid women. In fact, elsewhere in the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified as a beautiful woman. And elsewhere in the book of Proverbs, it talks about evil men. So, Women are not the problem. Sexual sin is the problem. And the Bible's clear from beginning to end that women are created in the image of God and they bear equal dignity, value, and worth to God. So that's the first thing. But another thing that I want to be clear on is that sexual sin isn't just a guy's struggle. It isn't just something that men struggle with. Now, admittedly, studies show that two-thirds of men have viewed pornography. But the same studies show that one-third of women have viewed pornography. Other studies um, show that 20% of married men have admitted to committing adultery against their spouse. But the same study showed that 13% of married women admit to the same thing. So it's not just a guy's struggle. The book of Proverbs is a wisdom book in the Bible, primarily written by a dad to share with his son. So it mainly gives wisdom to men. But there's another wisdom book in the Bible that is primarily written. It is designed for women. It's called the Song of Solomon. We're not preaching through that right now. We're preaching through Proverbs. But in the past, we have preached through Song of Solomon. You can go back in our podcast and find all those sermons there. Last thing about sexual sin that we just got to be clear on from out of the gate is this. The Bible defines sexual sin as any sexual activity outside of marriage between one man and one woman. Therefore, let me just be clear. That includes fornication, which is sexual activity before marriage. That includes emotional or sexual adultery. That includes um, polyamory, open marriage, gay and lesbian sex. That includes pornography, lust, masturbation, and many other expressions of sexual activity outside of marriage between one man and one woman. Now I get that clarification isn't gonna make me or our church popular, but I also trust that according to God's word, it will lead us to life and restoration in Jesus Christ. So now let's listen into this conversation between a father and a son with a, that understanding of sexual sin. And the father's gonna highlight three empty promises that sexual sin gives to us. The first empty promise is this. Sexual sin promises passion, but delivers perversion. Proverbs chapter seven, verses 13 through 15, describes sexual sin as a woman who seizes him and kisses him. And with bold face, she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I've paid my vow, so now I've come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly right? She seizes him, kisses him, bold face. I have sought you eagerly. All of those are words and images of passion. The woman goes on in Proverbs 7 to describe how her bed and her bedroom are lush and well-scented, and then she wraps up her passionate invitation in 7 verse 18, saying, come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. It all seems so intoxicating, which is exactly the word that Proverbs chapter 5 verse 20 uses. Sexual sin promises passion, but it delivers perversion. The, forbidden, the, the sexual sin is personified as a forbidden woman, a strange, an alien, a foreign woman. Now that is not a statement about ethnicity. That is a statement about sin's perversion. And here's what it means. When we engage in sexual activity outside of marriage, Though it may feel good to our bodies for a moment, usually our souls within us revolt. 
and say something like, this isn't truly good. This isn't what I was made for. And even maybe some of our souls are deceived or they've grown numb because of pain over the years. Even then, we don't lean into what our souls might feel in the moment. We lean in to the ancient and trusted wisdom of Scripture, which tells us that sexual sin isn't truly good for us. It's not what we were made for. Sexual sin promises passion, but it only delivers perversion. The second empty promise, sexual sin promises secrecy, but delivers shame. The adulterous woman says, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. In other words, this is all legal. It's no big deal to God. You see, I offered sacrifices and took care of that. She goes on, my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. No one will know. It's just our secret. Sexual sin promises secrecy but delivers shame. Proverbs 6, verse 32. He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. He will get wounds and dishonor, and his disgrace will not be wiped away. The dad saying to his son, don't destroy yourself. Listen, a day's coming when marriage will be difficult and adultery will come up to you and whisper empty promises in your ear. But don't buy the lie. It will only lead to disgrace and wounds and dishonor, shame. Third empty promise of sexual sin. Sexual sin promises no consequences, but delivers a costly grave. Did you notice? Listen to how the forbidden woman's words are described. They drip honey, smoother than oil, a smooth tongue. They are seductive. She speaks as though it's all easy and nothing will happen. There won't be any fallout or collateral damage or hurt relationships because of this. In fact, sexual sin promises this will make everything easier, smoother, sweeter. Sexual sin promises no consequences but delivers a costly grave. So after the man has heard these empty promises from sexual sin and he buys into them, Proverbs chapter 7, 22 and 23, describe what actually happens. It says, all at once he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. So hunters you probably know how to set out bait for a deer. And you probably even have set out cameras so that you can see when and where the deer take that bait. And then you perch nearby with your bow until the deer predictably takes the bait and you pierce its heart. The book of Proverbs gets the whole hunting game. But I think it, it pierces all of us when it tells us that it is actually sexual sin that's holding the bow. And the bait are these empty promises that it makes. And we are the deer who predictably take the bait. And in the end, just like the deer, he does not know that it will cost him his life. I know it's heavy, guys. I would have given anything for my dad to have this conversation with me that summer after eighth grade. <clears throat> it can be startling, shocking. If you're a guest with us, this is probably not the sermon you like, were hoping to hear. <laughs> I get it. We preach through books of the Bible. Next week will be different. Um, but it's true. It's true. And some of you, um, are probably hurting right now because you've taken the bait. You gave yourself over to sexual sin with the hopes of some renewed passion, and now all you feel is like a sense of hollow, empty, fake. 
Some of you, 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 you took the, the empty promise, you bought the lie that this will all be a secret, but now you're in shame whenever you're around other people. Or maybe you thought there wouldn't be any consequences, but your heart hurts so bad now whenever you see how it's affected your own family. The book of Proverbs gives us a reality check, even when it hurts. This is one way that the dad hopes that his son is delivered from the pains of sexual sin. Thankfully, though, the book of Proverbs in 5 through 7 isn't all just warnings and woes. The dad also highlights the true delights of marital passion. Like one way to avoid sexual sin is just to understand how empty it is. It doesn't deliver what we want. But another way to avoid sexual sin is to enjoy the true delights of marital passion. So we're just going to walk through some verses in Proverbs chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles, look at chapter 5, verse 15. It's where we're going to camp out a lot. I just felt like this probably isn't the right passage to have the scripture reader read, okay? Here we go. I'll have to read it. Proverbs 5, verse 15. Drink water from your own cistern, flowing water from your own well. Drink, the Bible says. Don't abstain. Don't avoid. Like, drink, drink, drink deeply. God has provided for your sexual thirst. He has given you a cistern in which you can store up water, and he's giving you flowing water. So there's a storehouse and a steady stream of delights right there in your own covenant, your own marriage, right there in your own home. He goes on in verse 16, should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? There's no need to find any source of delight anywhere else. Why would you go looking anywhere else? Don't spill your joys anywhere else. He continues, verse 17, let them, what is them? Them is the cistern and your flowing waters. Now, it doesn't take much to pick up the male and female husband and wife imagery here. Just read between the poetic lines with a little marital imagination, and I think you can get it. Let them, your flowing springs and that cistern, let them. Be for yourself alone, for your marriage only, for your covenant only, and not for strangers with you. Verse 18, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a lovely deer, a graceful doe. The dad is so wise here because let your fountain be blessed is clearly a euphemism, all right, that any married man would enjoy. But then the dad doesn't talk about the wife as a sexual object. He describes her as a covenant partner, as a lovely and graceful, a vulnerable and a beautiful person. So the dad is saying here that marriage includes both the passions of sex, but within the safety of a committed covenant relationship with your beautiful wife. So both the husband and the wife get honor. Both the husband and wife enjoy love. Both the husband and wife enjoy passion. He continues, verse 19, towards the end. Let her breast fill you at all times with delight. By now, I'm guessing we've realized the Bible is not prude or bashful or anti-passion, right? Let me just zoom in here on at all times. When your marriage is young and you're on your honeymoon, let your wife's body be your drink of delight. When your marriage is difficult and it's gonna take working through some conflict first, let your wife's body be your drink of delight. When your marriage is just crazy busy and there's a thousand different tasks that you have to accomplish, let your wife's body be your drink of delight. 
whenever the house is crazy and noisy and the kids are loud, close and lock the door and let your wife's body be your drink of delight. And when the house is quiet and all the kids are grown and gone, let your wife's body be your drink of delight at all times. Let your wife be your delight. In summary, he says, be intoxicated always in her love. It's like the dad saying, son, listen, man, there are times in marital passion where it feels intoxicating. I mean, son, you're going to get a little bit tipsy in the most holy and pure and righteous of ways. No alcohol needed. Don't even bother with that. Be intoxicated in the love of your wife, of your youth. It's a beautiful vision, a beautiful passage. But for some of us, maybe if we're honest, listening to verses like this in Proverbs 5, they can be painful to hear. You might be in a passionless marriage. One of the most lonely and isolating places to be, which is also when the allure of sexual sin can be strongest. But if you're in a passionless marriage, if you're there right now, maybe you are a wife and you know that your husband's heart has been devoted to his work instead of you for years now. Or maybe you're a husband and, and you just feel like your wife doesn't even want to be around you. She doesn't respect you. Like the, the passion of Proverbs 5 is long gone. If that's you, then hear this. The solution to a passionless marriage isn't to listen to the lies of sexual sin. Because they're empty promises. They'll only make it worse. The solution to a passionless marriage is to ask for help. Courageously and humbly share with someone you can trust and invite a wise mentor or maybe a Christian counselor. Ask them for help. And by God's grace, sow seeds just little by little into your marriage and trust, this is so hard, trust the healing and the timing of that healing to God himself. Others of you, you might be single, unmarried, and you're going, does Proverbs have anything to say to me? I think it kind of depends on where you are in your singleness. Um, If you want to be married, like you desire to get married, then I think Proverbs 5 here, the passage we just read, it can hold out a hope and a beautiful vision for you that you can desire, and then it can direct your desires while you wait for that vision to be fulfilled in marriage. But maybe you're single and you don't desire marry, uh, marriage. You don't want to get married. If so, then I, I would just point you to a, a couple of verses in Proverbs 7. Chapter 7, verses 4 and 5. It says, Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call insight your intimate friend. In your singleness, develop a close relationship with wisdom. A close relationship like a relationship you would have with a sibling. A sibling that you can trust. A sibling that you can talk to. A sibling that can provide you companionship in life. And then your close relationship with wisdom will give you companionship in such a way that verse 5, it will keep you from the forbidden woman from the adulteress with her smooth words. Okay, now let me close. I want to wrap up this morning by just giving a a word, some direction to anyone who might be ensnared in the trap of sexual sin right now. Maybe you are viewing pornography. Maybe you're exploring an affair. Maybe you've reconnected with an old romance online and you're starting to exchange messages. Maybe some way you're practicing sexual activity outside of marriage. There's a host of ways to be trapped in sexual sin. So if you're there, what should you do? Or maybe what can you do? The first thing is this. Listen, you should, and please hear me, you can 
you can do this, all right? I know the shame of sin says you can't do this, but the grace of God says you can. Here's what, first thing. Share it honestly with God. Share it honestly with God. Proverbs chapter five says that he already knows it all, but our God is the kind of all-knowing, all-seeing God who also delights in open, intimate friendship with his children. So King Solomon is the one who wrote these Proverbs we're looking at today. King Solomon's dad was King David. And King David messed up big time when it came to sexual sin, including adultery. Like, I know we all love to think of David as a man after God's own heart. He's amazing. He's godly. But man, he messed up bad when it came to sexual sin. And King David wrote a psalm. It's Psalm 51 that I think could help any of us trapped in sexual sin right now. King David wrote in Psalm 51 verse 3, and some of you might be able to write these same words today. He said, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, God, you only have I sinned. King David shares his sin honestly with God. And then he continues. And again, this is what you can do. You can pray this, all right? Don't listen to the shame. Listen to the scriptures. You can pray this and be honest with God. He continues in Psalm 51, verse 7. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. God, hide your face from my sins, blot out all my iniquities, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. This is so counterintuitive to like all the religious performance bones in our bodies, but when we turn towards God and we're honest, we confess our sexual sin to him, he promises to turn towards us. He'll turn away from that sin. He'll turn towards us, and he will wash us clean. He will make you whiter than snow. Jesus will take the perversion of sexual sin and he will give you one true and holy passion. Jesus will take the shame of sexual sin and he will give you honor. Jesus spent three days in that costly grave so that he could rise again and give you life so you can share honestly with him. He will turn to you and give you grace, pour his love on you, and welcome you. So first, share honestly with God. Secondly, find some wise friends. Doesn't have to be a lot. A few wise friends and share honestly with them. Don't hide from God and don't hide from friends. Don't buy the empty promise that it can stay a secret and there are no consequences. Find someone. It might be a wise friend in your city group or maybe you want to reach out to our care ministry here in our church or a Christian counselor or talk with one of our pastors, but find someone and share it with them honestly. I shared with you guys at the beginning of this message that I was first exposed to pornography that summer after my eighth grade year. Um, And that set in motion a sin pattern that hung around and it haunted me. It hollowed me out. It was on and off again for years, all the way through high school into my college years. My freshman year of college was horrible because in public, I was a church leader. In private, I had a porn addiction. Then in my sophomore year of college, a friend of mine, A brother in Christ approached me and he said, Doug, listen, I've never shared this with anyone, but I have to be honest. And I feel like I need to confess to you that I look at pornography. And in that moment, I had a choice to make. Do I admit to it also, or do I keep hiding my sin? I'm so glad I admitted it to him also. I said, me too. I've been doing the same thing. And he and I and a couple other brothers in Christ, we teamed up and we said, we're gonna fight this. 
And we spoke the love of God and the grace of God to each other. We reminded each other that those promises of sexual sin, they're empty, they're hollow, they don't deliver. And together we journeyed toward freedom. I'm so glad I did that. And so that's step two. The third thing I would encourage you to do, share honestly with God, share honestly with a friend, and then trust Trust that God will give you power and wisdom to flee from sin. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23, describes it as a lamp, a light, and a way of life. So just as sexual sin led you down a path into darkness and death, your courage, whenever you find that courage, Your courage to be honest and confess that to God and some wise friends, that courage will light, it will spark and light a lamp. And then that lamp will grow into a light like full day. And that light will grow into a whole new way of life. He can give you that life. And now the path of sexual sin, it varies based on how deep or dark or how prolonged you were in it, but the path is always marked by honest confession to God, honest confession to a few wise friends, and it's always marked by a restoration of life, life from the inside out. It's something that only God can do, but hear me, God will do it. He loves to restore people to life. He has promised that he will do it, and God always delivers on his promises. So, would you pray with me, and let's ask God to speak to us in this time. Father in heaven, thank you for your Bible. Thank you that it's real, and it's honest, and it even deals with stuff like this. So we say thank you. Thank you that your Bible is ancient, it is true, it is unchanged. We can trust it, and it is just as powerful today as when King Solomon first shared these words with his sons. Father, right now I pray for those in the room who have been affected by sexual sin. First, I pray for those who have been hurt because they've been sinned against sexually. It's such a deep hurt. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak to them the words that you know they need to hear. Thank you for their courage just to even make it through a message like this. Thank you for their kindness to listen. Jesus, I trust because of your Bible that you are able to bring healing to those persons. And if they haven't started that journey of healing, would you just invite them into it today and let them walk that journey with you and trusted Christian friends. And then, Lord Jesus, I pray for anyone. Maybe they're in the room. Maybe they're watching online who are right now trapped in sexual sin. And usually that that sin is lying to them, even now, saying, don't tell God this. That sin would lie to them and say, God can't love you. Oh, God. Oh, God, would you open their eyes to see the cross? Romans 5, verse 8, God demonstrates his kind of love in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh God, would you show them your kind of love, that you love them while they're still in it. You're not waiting for them to get their act together. Father, would you give them courage to be honest with you? Maybe some of them can even take a step and be honest with some friends. Maybe reach out for some counseling. Come, Holy Spirit. We're asking for fresh power, for fresh filling. Would you give us courage to step out and share? And God, I pray for those same people 
So sexual sin has a way of going so deep in our bones, in our bodies, to wrap so tightly in our brains that we think there's no way out. I'm stuck in this forever. Oh God, you say the opposite. There is a way out. It may start as just a spark or a little lamp, but it will grow to a light and it will even grow to a whole new way of life. Holy Spirit, would you do miraculous work for those trapped in sin and give them faith to see there is a new way to live. There's a different way to live. We are at your mercy, Lord God. Thank you for being a God who loves to give mercy. You delight to give mercy. We pray all these things in Jesus' good name. Amen. Uh, City Light, thank you so much for your kindness this morning. It was a heavy topic.